Good to see all of you in the house of the Lord. Pray that you're doing well. Amen. Amen. God is good. <clears throat> all right. This particular chapter deals with joys in life. How to have joy in life. A lot of times things are in contrast to that uh, in these Proverbs to show us what not to do. Uh, because if we do them, we don't have joy in our life. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, if you'll turn there again, Proverbs 17, verse 1. If you have it, say, praise the Lord. <clears throat> All right. Love the book of Proverbs. Amen. Verse 1, then I'll let you sit down, okay? Better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than a house full of sacrifices with strife. Amen. Father, we come before you right now. We ask your blessing to be on the, upon the preaching and the teaching of your holy word. God, let us apply these principles of life that we might have joy, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Okay, pretty self-explanatory, right? You can have, the Bible says here, a house full of sacrifices. One translation is, a house full of slaughtered animals. And it's, so you'll understand, it's sort of like saying having a, a freezer full of meat. Okay? How many of you ever bought a, like a half of, half of beef or something like that, you know, and got the big old freezer full of beef? Anybody done that before? We've done that before, okay? Amen. So that's basically what it's talking about in common day speech, to have a freezer full of meat, all right? Got plenty to eat in the house, but there's a lot of strife. It's a lot of problems. Solomon knew a lot about that. Had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Amen. And I know he had a lot of problems. I do. You know how I know? Because the one godly woman that he found, the one real godly woman that he found, the Shulamite, she said no to him. Why did she say no to him? Because she didn't want to be a part of the harem. You know. Basically what Solomon did was he traded love for lust. And so as a result of that, when it came time for him to find a godly woman, when she saw all the other women that Solomon had in his life, she said, I don't want to be a part of it. And I think she is the only one that could have brought peace to his house and peace to his heart. But he had already messed up so severely with all these other women. And uh, so he knows what he's talking about when he says, you have plenty to eat, but have a lot of strife in your house. And you've got 700 women, 300 concubines, a total of a thousand of them. You know there's going to be fussing and fighting and squabbling and jealousy and praise the Lord. Amen. It's just the way it is. So, hallelujah. Better to have peace in your home. <clears throat> Amen? If you want joy in your life, get rid of the squabbling and the quarreling and the fussing and the fighting and jealousy and all that stuff that's going on. Have peace in your home. It's better to have less on the table and peace in your life than a whole freezer full of meat and a bunch of problems. Amen? Praise God. So make sure when you find somebody, you find the right person to begin with. Very important. Okay, verse 2. A wise servant shall have rule over a son. Now that is interesting, isn't it? He said a wise servant shall have rule over a son. So there are times when servants even find themselves in a position of ruling over the son of a house. Now how is that possible? Because the qualities of the son are not what they should be. The qualities of the son bring shame to the house. And every once in a while, you'll find a servant in the house that is more faithful, more diligent, more industrious, more wise than a son in the house. That's just the way it is. So let's look, look at the Word of God to give you an example. Go over to 1 Kings chapter 11. And there was a man by the name of Jeroboam. Of course, Rehoboam was Solomon's son. And Rehoboam only brought shame to Solomon. But Jeroboam was a servant of a widow. 
And Solomon saw this servant of a widow. Start in verse 26, 1 Kings 11. It tells us something about his characteristics. Okay, 1 Kings eleven twenty six. 26. Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, an Ephrathite of Zeretta, Solomon's servant. Say Solomon's servant. Whose mother's name was Zeruah. What was she? She was a widow. And he is a servant of Solomon. He's not even his son. Right? Even he lifted up his hand against the king. And this was the cause that he had lifted up his hand against the king. Solomon built Milo and repaired the breaches of the city of David his father. And the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. Do you see that? Even though he was a servant, not the son, he was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon seen the young man that he was industrious. He made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. And then eventually, Jeroboam will become the king over the ten tribes of Israel. So he was not a son of Solomon. He was a servant. But when Solomon saw his diligence, his industry, his wisdom, amen, uh, that he excelled in life. He took him and he put him in charge of various things. And eventually he became a king over Israel. So verse 2, a wise servant shall have rule over a son that causes shame. Rehoboam caused shame to Solomon. And shall have part of the inheritance among the brethren. Amen? Verse 3, the finding pot is for silver and the furnace for gold. What is that? What happens there in the finding pot? For silver and gold. Well, that's where the dross is removed. Good, brother. So you heat it up, right? Heat the silver up, heat the gold up. When it does, the dross comes to the top. and You skim that dross off the top so you can have purity in the gold or the silver. And so what we have here, the finding pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord trieth the heart. So what he's saying there is that God causes dross to remove, be removed out of our life. How many of you know there's some things in our life that are not pure? Okay. Well, how does God get rid of that dross? Trials, tests. Just like the fire is applied to the gold or the silver, God allows tests and trials to come to us to get rid of the dross. And when you're going through that process, you've got to be careful because if you're, if you're not, you get bitter toward God. And what God is trying to do, He's trying to make you better. The tests and the trials will make you better if you let them work for you. They get rid of the impurities out of your life. Now, uh, somebody that works with gold, they'll keep working with that gold and heating it up and removing the dross and keep heating it up, removing the dross until they can see their reflection or their face in that gold. When they can see their face in that gold, they know that they've got the dross out of the gold. So what God's going to do is, and you have to be willing to go through that process as a believer, He's going to keep heating your life up. He's going to keep heating my life up. He's going to keep removing the dross. So let the fire work for you. Let the test work for you. Let the trials work for you. Don't waste them. You know, you get all upset and bitter and not like it. It's not going to work for you. Amen. So God is the one who is in charge of removing the dross out of our lives. And not very many people are going to make it because they're not willing to go through that process of testing and trial from the hand of God. And they give up and they quit and whatever. Uh, but that is not a wise thing to do. It's wise to understand the process that a finding pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord trieth the hearts. Verse 4. A wicked doer giveth heed to false lips, and a liar giveth ear unto a naughty tongue. So basically, you have somebody, if a person is a liar, they have a tendency in their life to believe liars. They have a tendency to believe lies, okay? Because that's their nature, that's their character. So again, verse 4, a wicked doer giveth heed to false lips, that's a liar, and a liar giveth ear to a naughty tongue. So liars believe liars. All right? Amen? Verse 5, Whoso mocketh the poor reproacheth his maker, and he that is glad at calamity shall not be unpunished. 
Now, a good example, you go to Obadiah uh, uh, verses 16 and 17, and you'll see a person by the name of Edom. Edom or Esau. The brother of Jacob, right? Now, the Bible tells us that whenever Israel was on the way to the promised land, that his brother, the Edomites, did not help them. In fact, they rejoiced when their brother fell into calamity. They rejoiced when Israel got in trouble. They celebrated it. They were excited when their brother fell. They were excited when problems came to their brother. And so Obadiah, verse 16 to 17, it talks about that, that God is going to judge Esau because they rejoiced in the calamities that would come upon the brother. Now, amen, you with me here? Now, some things come from the hand of God, discipline, correction, but you don't rejoice in that. That's not a good thing, amen. If a brother falls or fails and calamities come to them as a result of that, we're not supposed to celebrate that. We're, we're supposed to learn from it, acknowledge it, and say, you know, we don't follow that path because something might happen to us the same way. But we don't celebrate, we don't rejoice the calamities of a brother. Amen. Okay? So whoso mocketh, mocketh the poor, reproacheth maker, he that is glad of the calamities shall not be unpunished. Very serious. Okay. Leave it in the hands of God. Verse 6, children's children are the crown of old men. What is that talking about? Well, he's got a grandfather. Grandfather's got grandkids, correct? Okay, children's children are the crown of old men and the glory of children are what? Their fathers. So what's the picture here? The picture is we've got grandfathers with the grandkids around them. We've got fathers with their kids around them. What do you have? You have a picture of a home that's stable. Okay? Today we don't have much stability in homes. Sad to say, even in the church of the living God, there's not a lot of stability in the homes today. There's so much, there's so much problems, confusion in the home, calamities, not much stability in homes. But the Bible talks about it here, that when you've got that stability, you've got grandfathers, the grandkids, the fathers with the kids, and the pictures here of stability in the home. It's a, it's a blessing, it's a crown. Amen. From God. Amen. Verse 7. Excellent speech becometh not a fool, much less do lying lips a prince. Not much good is going to come out of the mouth of a fool. Now, every once in a while, something good may come out even of the mouth of a fool. Praise the Lord. But the problem with it, it won't be long till the next thing that comes out of their mouth is going to cancel the good that they just said because they always have a way, you know, of just messing it up. So not much good. You're not going to hear much good come out of the mouth of a fool. Just stay away from them. Amen. They don't have any good to say. What good they do say is going to be messed up by the next thing they say. And it talks about princes who have lying lips. That's not appropriate for a prince. If you're, you're a prince, I'm looking at princes today. In a sense, spiritual princes, you shouldn't be a liar. That is not appropriate for the sons of God, the people of God, to be liars. Don't be a liar. That is not appropriate. Amen. So we see excellent speech becometh not a fool. It's not becoming for a fool to have excellent speech. Even though every once in a while you hear them say something good, it'll be canceled by the next thing they say. Do not be a prince and lie. That doesn't go together either. All right, verse 8. A gift is a precious stone in the eyes of him that hath it. Whithersoever it turneth, it prospereth. Verse 9. He that covereth a transgression seeketh love. But he that repeateth, repeateth the matter separateth very friends. We've already talked about that before. Gossiping and talebearing is a thing that will destroy friendships. So don't be a talebearer. Amen. Be somebody that covers. Somebody comes to you and tells you something in confidence. You don't go run and blab it around to everybody. You tell everybody. You know what I'm saying? Amen. Now, if you are in a situation, you need to let authority know something, that's different. But you don't go and you don't tell, be a talebearer and gossip about uh, other people's business. Amen. Brother Emmons was talking to me the other day. He had mentioned something I thought was really important, really kind of falls along these lines right here. Brother Dice, we've heard about Brother Dice. Brother Dice was uh, Brother Edmonds' pastor. Brother Edmonds was... Brother Dice is assistant pastor in California. So he knew him very well. And Brother Dice was my mentor later in years when he moved to Odessa, Texas, when we first started pastoring in Crane. Okay? 
he was our mentor at that time. Um, but he was, I guess, what Brother Edmonds was telling us yesterday, he was sitting around a bunch of board members, you know, high-ranking officials in the kingdom of God, and they were asking Brother Dice about some questions, you know, some things that were going on, and Brother Dice was not answering them, was not responding to the questions that they were asking him. And so they said, now, Brother Dice, you can trust us. You'll tell us. Come on and tell us. So you can trust us with what you're going to tell us. He said, I'm not worried about telling you. He said, I can't trust the people you're going to tell. <laughs> Brother Dice was very, a very extremely wise man. Amen. And I thank God to have had him as uh, my mentor in life. But he said, I'm not worried about you. I'm just worried about who you're going to tell. <laughs> Implying that you can't keep a secret and the ones you tell are for sure not going to keep a secret. <laughs> so be careful when you start blabbing and talking and you think, well, you know, this is a secret between you and me. Oh, it, it won't stay with that person. And it's for sure not going to stay with the person they tell. So be wise with who you talk to and tell secrets to. Very important, right? Yeah, you'd be surprised you told somebody something in secret and everybody knows about it. How'd that happen? Because you can't trust a person that they're going to tell. And Brother Edmund said, everybody got quiet. And that's where, that's Brother Dice, that's the way he was. He, he pretty much, he'd tell you right and wrong. He'd tell you if you were right, he'd tell you if you were wrong in a heartbeat. He wouldn't just let you go along with things. And uh, that's just the way he was. Very outspoken. And especially if you were wrong, he exegeting the Word of God. He was known to stand right up and say, you're wrong. And he had the right, the authority to do it. Because he knew that Bible inside out. There was a time he said he could stand up and he could open the Bible in any place in the Bible and preach from it. That's how much he knew the Word of God. So pretty much if he said, you know, you were wrong about the Word of God, you probably were. I'd say, you just say, okay, yes, Brother Dice, you can straighten me out later. Hallelujah. Amen. But he was very wise, very wise man. <clears throat> Knew how to handle situations like that. They just got quiet and didn't respond after that. Amen. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Brother Emmons is telling me about Brother Dice. says one day, he says he's walking along, and Brother Emmons pulled glasses off of his face, and he just said, I hate these glasses. I hate these glasses, you know. And Brother Dice looked at him and said, You hate those glasses? You mean to tell me that you hate what gives you the ability to read? You get the point. <laughs> it always corrects you in life if you were wrong, right? Praise the Lord. So he knew what to say at the right time. That's why I love him. I wish he was still alive today. I'd still be learning from him. In fact, I still am learning from him. I listen to a lot of his old tapes and, and things in life just to, just to get the wisdom and the knowledge that he had. So be careful about who uh, you share information with because there are people that will just gossip it away. Amen? Amen. Keep it a secret. Hallelujah. Right? Are, we going, to, are you going to obey that? Are you going to walk in that? <laughs> just look at somebody and say, oh, come on, tell me, you can trust me. No, I, I can trust you, but I can't, t I can't trust the people you're going to tell. <laughs> Amen. How many of y'all been ever bit by telling a secret to somebody? I think we probably all have, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was a secret. It didn't say a secret long, did it? Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> he that repeateth the matter separateth friends. That's it. His tailbearer, always gossiping, sharing information. That's what some people are, man. They've got a lot. I don't know what it is. They, some people ought to become uh, undercover agents. Really, they ought to. Informants, you know. That's their job, man. He just going, the new hottest news, well. I mean, it, it don't even have to make it to the newspaper. It goes straight from the cell phone. <laughs> And it's normally twisted and it's normally not accurate information anyway. You know? So that's not wise. You're not walking in wisdom if you're that kind of person. Amen. Praise the Lord. All you're doing is destroying friendships. You're just destroying relationships. That's all you're doing. 
And it's all probably already destroyed anyway. But you're just throwing fuel on the fire. Amen. So listen to the Word of God. Yeah. Kind of fun talking about somebody else, isn't it? Until somebody starts talking about you. Then it gets different, doesn't it? Verse 10, uh, a reproof entereth more into a wise man. Say a wise man. Why, why is a reproof able to enter into a wise man? Because they will respond to it. Now we say wise man, we're talking about wise women too. So I'm just talking about men here. We're talking about women too. You're a wise person. When the Word of God comes to you, reproof comes to you, you receive it. You let it come in. You let it do the work. You let it correct you. You get right. Look at your neighbor and say, get right. Okay, I'm not right sometimes. Sometimes you're not right. And the truth comes and it corrects us. So if we're a meek person, a wise person, we receive that correction. And what do we do? We get right. Look at your neighbor and say, I get right when I'm wrong. Amen. Isn't it a wonderful gift from God? That when you're wrong, you can get right? Yeah. Yeah. So you're wise, you get, you're wrong, and correction comes to you, you get right. But uh, it keeps going. Look at what it says about the fool, though. Right? It says, okay, reproof entereth more into a wise man than a hundred stripes into a fool. I mean, you can be some people black and blue, and they're still not going to get right. Why? Because they're fools. They can't be corrected. You, know, you try to correct them, they don't receive correction. They don't get right. But a fool, you can beat them and beat them and beat them and beat them. They won't ever get right. Read Isaiah, the first chapter. God had to do that with the nation of Israel. But there's so much sin in their life, they didn't even recognize their maker. Didn't even recognize their God. You know? An animal could recognize its master that fed it, took care of it. But Israel didn't even recognize that God was their father. God took care of them. And so God had to just, from the, he said, from the top of your head to the soles of your feet, you got bruises. you just been beat and beat and beat and beat. And all of you are just beat. Amen. But they had the mark of a fool. Yeah, they beat them black and blue and they still wouldn't get right with God. That's the mark of a fool. Mark of a wise person, when they know they're wrong, they get right. The Word of God comes to them, they receive the Word of God. And they said, that's me, I need to repent, I need to get right with God. That's a wise person. A fool is somebody that keeps on staying wrong. They just refuse to get right with God. Hey, hey man, I don't want to be a fool to you. I don't want to go through life just constantly beat and beat like black and blue. No, I want to be wise and receive the correction of God and get right with the Lord. Verse 11. An evil man seeketh only rebellion. Therefore, a cruel messenger shall be sent against him. An evil man only seeketh rebellion. You got somebody that's got a rebellious nature about them and they're evil and they're wicked. You know what God says he's going to do? He's going to send a messenger of destruction against them. What does that mean? What's a messenger? A messenger is an angel. He could have put an angel right there in that verse when he said, An evil man seeketh only rebellion, therefore a cruel angel shall be sent against him. But a God, you're a person that's in constant rebellion, God will send an angel against you. That could be his angel, God's angel, coming against you. Or it could be that he, he sends a demonic spirit against you. Amen? Because of the rebellion that's in that heart. So I don't want to deal with this. I don't want a, a messenger being sent from God, you know. Brother Edmonds, I hope you don't mind me sharing some things that we've been talking about. But, you know, he was talking about calls upon people's lives. You know, God's got a call in this person's life to do something and they don't do it. And he said something very interesting. Uh, he said, you know, I've heard the statement that was, has been made, if you cannot do it, don't do it. When it comes to the call in ministry. 
Have you ever, I've probably made that statement because I've heard that statement made, you know. Well, if you can go through life without, you know, being in the ministry, then go through life without being in the ministry. Amen. But Brother Edmund said it like this. He said, why would you want, if God is calling you to do something, why would you want to go through life and constantly be hit on the top of the head? Don't try to, he's what he said, is don't run from the call of God. Don't run from it. He said, now I'll get back to the verse in a minute. Brother Edmund said this. He said, God can take your house. And he began to list things, you know, about what God could do in your life if you're in rebellion against God. And I said, Brother Edmonds, I said, the problem today is that most people don't believe that God would do that. So they keep living in rebellion against the Word of God. And they don't realize, and this is the verse right here that will back that up, that God can send a messenger against your life if you are living in rebellion. You can begin to lose things. He said, why lose your job? Lose your job, lose your, uh, maybe your house, lose everything you got. He said, God can do it. You need to fear God, brothers and sisters. He can bless you or He can take, take it away. Amen. The Lord giveth, Job said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, I, I'm amazed at people, the way they walk. They don't fear God. They don't reverence God. They, they don't respect God. They don't look at their life in the light of, you know what? God can come in here and judge me. He can take everything I have. He can. Now, He's a good God. I don't think He wants to do that. But if you and I are in constant rebellion, the Bible says God can send an angel, a messenger, against you and me. And I'm, I'm with Brother Edmonds. I don't want to keep getting hit in the head. I want to obey God, bow my knee before God and say yes to the Lord. I'll obey God. Obey you, Lord. Amen. I don't want no messenger coming my way. Hallelujah. The problem is today, most people, when they start losing things and having problems, they never acknowledge that it's a correction from God. They never will. You know why? Because they're full of rebellion. Amen. The Bible is true. I believe the Word of God. An evil man seeketh only rebellion, therefore a cruel messenger shall, shall be sent against him. And who is it that's sinning? It's God that's sending the messenger against him. So don't be a rebellious person. Okay, I'll give you an example by the way, the Word of God. His name was Absalom. Now, Absalom was the son of David, right? Okay, you got Solomon. David was the son of Solomon, right? No. You have David. Solomon the son of who? Come on, I'm trying to... Are you there? Solomon is the son of who? David, David right? David had another son, right? What was his name? Absalom. Solomon was a pretty wise son, but Absalom wasn't. Absalom was a man that was in constant rebellion against God. He had a rebellious heart. He was so rebellious, he tried to dethrone his own father out of the kingdom. Amen? undermined his own father. Can you imagine that? He was a wicked, rebellious, evil son. And eventually, you know, the sign of his rebellion is his old long hair. Had a real long hair, man. The Bible tells us he's riding one day. He got caught up in a tree. His hair got caught up in a tree. And he got killed. Amen. And then old David, he cried and cried and cried over Absalom, you know. David had tried to cover up Absalom in his life tried to cover him up. You know, tried, tried, David tried to make excuses for Absalom's behavior. Amen. And David always, always blamed himself, really, for the way Absalom turned out. He sure did. He tried to cover it up, but eventually, uh, Absalom died. The messenger was sent against him. So you don't want to be that kind of person that's in rebellion against your father. Because that will bring very, very traumatic, hard times. And it may not be quickly. It may be after a while, after a period of time. Amen? So messengers can come. These are destructive angels that can come from the hand of God. Amen. Verse 12. 
Let a bear robbed of her whelps meet a man rather than a fool in his folly. You know, you'd rather, how many of you like to be meet a big old bear? You're out hiking somewhere, you meet a big old bear. Well, I've read stories, you know, about bears. I, I try to get a little bit of information about bears because when we go camp and whatever, we see bears. Okay? And uh, thank God we have something more than a tent to sleep in because one night we were in, in the motor home that we have and that thing started rocking. I'm not kidding you. And so I got up, I looked out the window, and there was a big old black bear right there nut, pushing up against uh, that motor home. You know, he, you know what he's going for? He's going after this sugar water that we put out for the mocking hummingbirds to come. He pulled that thing, amen, and when he did, he rocked the whole deal, man. But thank God I had something more than a tent, right? But I found out real quick, you take the sugar water inside, don't leave it out at night because bears are going to come right up to your front doorstep and rock your house, dude. You know? So I, I have, a, you know, I've read stories about if you come in contact with a grizzly, how do you respond? Okay. Okay, if you come in contact with a black bear, how do you respond? You come in contact with a brown bear, how do you respond, you know? Praise the Lord. I need to brush up because I don't remember any of it. <laughs> One of them you're supposed to like be strong and aggressive. Make noise. You know, scream at it. You know, throw rocks at it. And it'll turn and go away. The other ones, I think it's the grizzly. You don't do that. You, you lay down and you act like you're dead. Okay. Amen. But I don't think any of us want to meet a big old bear, black bear, brown bear, grizzly, whatever it is, in the middle of the road. Amen. Praise God. But every once in a while, you can detract that bear. Okay, I've read stories. You know, man met a bear and he started, he rat lunged at it and screamed at it and it just turned around and walked away. You know, Right? Read stories of people acting like they were dead, and the bear just kind of mauled them a little bit, ate their head, ate some of their hair, and you know, mauled them a little bit. And, but at least didn't kill them, right? Well, God says right here is it's better to meet a bear bereft of her cubs than to meet a fool. You know why? Because sometimes you can get the bear turn around. Amen. Sometimes the bear will go away, but a fool won't. Best thing you can do when you come in contact, you know what a, the definition of the fool, we've already talked about it, is somebody who says no to God. It is somebody who will not obey the word of the living God. They say no to it. In fact, they know it's the word of God, but they won't do it. When you come in contact with somebody like that that says no to God, you run from them. Don't stand there. See, you got more of a chance with a bear leaving you alone, bereft of her cubs, than you got with somebody that's a fool that says no to the Word of God. Best thing you can do is turn and run as fast as you can from a fool. Amen? Stay away from them. Stay away from people who say no to God. Yeah, you get, a, get around them, they start messing with your head. Yeah. And they're going to, I'm going to promise you something, they're going to stand their ground. They're going to stand their ground in rebellion against the Word of God. They're not going to give in. And they're more bold against God than you are for God. It's the best thing you can do. Just get away from them. That's what he's telling you right here. Amen. Say praise the Lord. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. But he got somebody that's, you know, obviously pretty self-explanatory here that has done somebody good and then they turn around and they do them wrong. Uh-oh. Well, God's going to make sure that that's taken care of. That's not going to go overlooked. Now you think about David and Uriah. Uriah the Hittite was a faithful soldier to King David. Amen? Going to battle, fighting the battles of the king, and when... He's out there fighting the battles of the king. David stays behind. The Bible says when kings go to war, David didn't go to war. He stayed behind. And Bathsheba 
And she's not, you know, she's at fault as well. She's not innocent. She knew what she was doing. And she went out on the rooftop. She took a bath out there in, in the open. And David saw her and called her. And you know the story. Committed adultery against Uriah, his wife, with his wife. And then had Uriah sent to the front lines and killed. Well, that man was loyal. He was a loyal soldier to David. When David brought him off the field, you know, try to get him, you know, to go in to be with his wife, to make it look like he was the daddy. Uriah said, I can't go and be with my wife. Not when the men are out there in the fields fighting. He was faithful to God. He was faithful to David. And what did David do? He turned around, and that good that Uriah did, he turned it around, and he destroyed the man. Had him sent for the front lines, basically committed murder. Now, you know the story. I don't have to preach it to you. The life of David after that event. You know, the life of David is like this. You study it. And then all of a sudden he commits adultery with Bathsheba and has Uriah the Hittite murdered. And his life is like this. Up to that point, David never lost a battle in the field. Up to that point. After that, his life went like this. And his home fell apart. Absalom rebelled against him. Amen. All kind of sexual misconduct within the family. I mean, it was a mess. You know. Now we know why. It was a judgment from God Almighty. You see people today in similar situations, all their families are in a mess, man. All kind of immorality in the family. It's wise to check it out and see. What was the root cause of that? Amen? Now the Bible tells us right here, Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. It's going to find you, brothers and sisters. You know, you try to do something good for somebody, and they turn around, and they just try to destroy you. Don't worry. You just put it, put it in the hands of God, and you let God take care of it, because the Bible says God's going to take care of it. Praise the Lord. Amen. Sad, but it happens. Verse 14. The beginning of strife is as when one letteth out water. Therefore, leave off contention before it melt, uh, med meddled with. My eyes, I'm, I tell you what, I'm getting too old. I can't even see anymore. But what he's saying here, you know, you ever seen like a bridge? I've seen cartoons or whatever, or you got a little little trickle of water coming through the bridge. Right? So they, you know, the cartoon character puts his finger in it. Then it breaks out over here. So he puts his finger here. And it breaks out over here. So he puts his toe in there. It breaks out over here. He puts another toe in there, you know. <laughs> well, <laughs> what's he trying to do? He's trying to keep that thing from collapsing and becoming a flood of water right through the bridge. And so what God is saying, he's saying something very similar, okay? <laughs> Pardon the illustration. <laughs> Uh, I know you know. I know you've seen that before. So he said, "You know, it's like this. It says like a little water is coming out, trickling out. And pretty soon, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until you have a big flood. So you want to stop it before it begin comes something very big. Okay. So you get in the problem into a into a fight or whatever it is. As the Bible is telling us, nip it in the bud." as fast as you possibly can. Because the more you feed it or let it flow, let it grow, pretty soon you've got a flood on your hands, man. So you nip these things, nip strife. Say nip strife in the bud when it's just beginning. Amen? If you don't, man, it, you know how it is. It gets worse, doesn't it? It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then people's emotions get involved in it. And you got other people being brought into it, and pretty soon you got a huge mess on your hands. So as soon as the strife begins, you deal with it right there. You take care of it. Nip it in the bud very quickly. Amen. Therefore, leave off contention before it be meddled with. Amen. Verse 15, He that justifieth the wicked, and he that condemneth the just, even both are an abomination to the Lord. Now this is very serious. You're a child of God, but you condone or you justify the wicked practices 
of somebody. That is an abomination to God Almighty. Okay? So we should not be siding with or condoning with wickedness that's in other people's lives. I don't know what the motive would be to do that, but that's an abomination to God Almighty to justify the wicked. And then there's some that condemn the just. Even they, even both of them are abomination of the Lord condemn the just. They People hate Christians just because they're Christians. And I, you know, there's a message right there. You can teach that. Take that word right there. If you're looking for something to preach, take that one scripture right there and go through history and see how Christians have been treated, how they've been martyred. Brother Ezra was telling me the other day, he said, we go to China and, you know, up there on the coast, he says, uh, they have, he calls them churches, okay, in mainland China. Well, mainland China, it's against the law for you to be a Christian. It's against the law, man. Okay. And he told me, he said, it's getting worse there. It's going back to the days of Mount Sitong, he said. Cruel emperor. Cruel persecution. So when they go to the main, mainland China, he said, what's interesting, they can have the Quran. They can have other religious material, but the only one they can't have is a Bible. Christianity. Christianity, see, the just are condemned by the world. Persecuted, put to death. He said when they go over there to China, when they baptize the people in Jesus' name, it's not like us. We come up here and we baptize people in the name of the Lord. They get filled with the Holy Ghost. We have freedom of religion. No persecution. We don't have to worry about people, officers, law enforcement coming and shutting us down, taking us to prison. Do we? No. He said, when they get over there, they go baptize people out in the ocean. And he said, they're constantly watched under constant surveillance. In fact, before Brother Edmonds and, and them arrived there in mainland China, the word has already been out that they're coming. And the authorities are already looking for them before they ever get there. He said sometimes they'll arrive a week before they ever get there and these authorities are asking questions about Brother Edmonds. What they're about. Constant surveillance all the time. He said they take him out there in the water in the ocean. They baptize him in Jesus' name and they, they act like, you know, that they're missing a ball. So somebody, they're playing ball out there and they'll act like they're missing the ball and they baptize him in the name of Jesus. They have to act like they're playing ball. He said within just a few minutes of doing that, the authorities are right there to find out what's going on. Major persecution, the church in China. He told me, he said, Brother Carter, and I'm not going to call him by name, but there's a man there that we know very well, him and his wife, they're in the ministry there, and uh, you know they're going to mainland China and they're trying to win souls over there and he said, Brother Carter, he said, don't be surprised if I give you a call asking you to pray for brothers and sisters so-and-so because they may end up in prison over there. See, that's because the just are condemned. Christianity is a faith that is fought by other people. It's real. In America, we don't know much about that, you know. Uh, maybe cold shoulders, people talk about you, whatever, mock you, make fun of you, whatever. Uh, we, but we don't know much about the kind of persecution that's in China. Are you with me? Now, a few years ago I sat down with him and we were going to go to Beijing. And uh, we went to Taiwan and then after we went to Taiwan, we went to Beijing. And I sat down with Brother Edmonds. I said, now Brother Edmonds, when we go to Beijing, I said, I'm going to take your cue. Okay, you know, I'm, uh, if you if you talk to people about the Lord, then I'm going to take that cue and I'll talk to people about the Lord. Okay, uh, but I'm not going to go over there and mess up anything. See, I'm going to watch you, brother. Let's keep my eyes on, because he knows what's what's about there. He's telling me about one preacher that went over there, and uh, there was a work that was started. You know, souls were coming in. He went over there and he didn't know what he was doing. You know, he wasn't wise. And uh, because of his actions, the thing was shut down. So I said, I'm not going to do that. When I go with you to Beijing, 
uh, I'm not going to do anything that's going to disrupt or cause attention to you because you're going to be coming back to China and trying to win souls. There's no reason I should be over here trying to act bold and, you know, whatever, uh, and mess up your future work. So I said, if I, when we go over there, if I don't need to say anything about the Lord, I won't. It's not because I'm afraid of persecution. It's I don't want to miss His ability to win the loss there and have churches there. Or there's some preachers don't have no sense. They don't know what they're doing. They go over there and they're, you know, I'm, I'm, praise the Lord. I think there's some courageous people. You can be courageous, you know, say, but what good is it going to be if you're with a missionary from Taiwan, all right, and they already got their eyes on him, and you're walking over there with a sign, I'm a Christian. And you're walking next to him. Well, you're courageous, I give you that, but you're pretty stupid too. As you're affecting the ability of this man to preach. So you've got to be wise, because there's a lot of people that are against the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, the more and more, the closer we get to the coming of the Lord, you're going to see more and more of this in, in the United States of America, this anti-God, anti-Christ spirit, religious spirit. You're going to have to be very wise and understand there's some people you got to be careful around. Okay? Amen. Is everybody with me here today? So pray for Brother and Sister Edmonds because they're in a dangerous situation. Now, in Taiwan, they have no problem. It's a free republic. They have church all day long, do whatever they want to do. They've never, he, they have, they've been there 40 years and have never had any problems in Taiwan. When they go to China, it's a totally different world. Okay, so you need to pray for them. Okay, amen. So he that justifies the wicked and he that condemneth the just, even they both are an abomination to the Lord. Hallelujah. God's a good God. Brother Amos was talking about the the Chinese language, Jeremiah's learning traditional Chinese uh, instead of the, what's the other? Simplified. Uh, there's a simplified version of Chinese and then there's the traditional. And the traditional Chinese has in the characters, the characters come out of the Scripture. They teach biblical principles. For example, righteousness, the character of righteousness is a lamb over me. A lamb over me. But the simplified version of that language doesn't have that, does it, Jeremiah? Doesn't have it. Picture's gone. And I said, well, Brother Emmons, I said, who simplified the language? Who took that, the biblical teachings out of that language like that? He said, the devil did it. And he said, that simplified language is used in, in, in course studies to lead people to communism. Okay? So, in America, we're not really aware of what's going on, but it's it's a major deal. Now, in Taiwan, they are the care, caretakers of the traditional Chinese language. Taiwanese are. Okay? Praise the Lord. Amen. So, pretty interesting stuff. He that justifies the wicked, and he that condemneth the just, even they both are an abomination to the Lord. Something God hates. Verse 16. Wherefore is there a price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing he hath no heart to it? That means simply, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, you can't teach a fool anything. They just, you can't teach them. They just, they don't have the ability or don't want it. They know, but they don't want to know. Okay? You just can't teach them anything. Verse 17. And 18, talk about friendships. A friend loveth at all times. A brother is born for adversities. Thank you, Jesus. We need good friends, don't we? And a friend's going to love you at all times. Jesus was a friend sicker clothed than a brother. Amen? Loves at all times. And he is born for adversity. You start going through something, a friend's going to be there with you. Amen? But then we see... The Bible goes on and says in verse 18, A man void of understanding striketh hands and becometh surety in the presence of his friend. You want to lose friends? Get money involved. You want to lose friends? Be the guarantee of a debt. Yeah. It'll break up friendships. So don't strike hands with each other friend in, in a friendship basis uh, to guarantee the debt of somebody else. That's the good way to destroy friendships. Okay? Amen? 
Now, I know y'all are caring people, loving people. You want to help people. I know there are times when you are willing to open up your home to family members. Now, I'm talking about adults. I'm not talking about kids. I'm talking about grown adults. You know, and you're willing to open up your house and have them come and live for, with you. Okay? You need to be very careful about that. Okay? I very rarely have I ever seen that work. You know, it might start out pretty good, pretty good deal. Everybody looks like it's a pretty good deal, you know. People that open the house and people that are coming into the house, it's all a wonderful thing. Thank you so much for doing this for us. But after a while, it just disintegrates. And it destroys relationships, families, friendships. You should be, be careful. Amen. Hallelujah. I told a family member one time, not in the church, I told him, I said, and another family member was going to move in with him. I said, don't do that. I said, I know you mean well, and I know you want to help them, but I said, don't do that. It's going to create problems. And she said, my family member said, I should have listened to you. That's exactly what happened. Didn't do anything but create problems. She didn't mean well, see. Or do you strike hands? You want to strike hands with a friend? You're trying to help them out, trying to help them up, you know? You better be careful. Just the very opposite could happen. It could have destruction. So you better think about what you're doing when you start becoming the guarantor of, of somebody's livelihood where they live, whatever. It causes a lot of problems. Amen? So be careful. Say praise the Lord. Verse 19. He loveth transgressing that loveth strife, and he that exalteth his gate seeketh destruction. Now, this is a proverb that's teaching against the flaunting of wealth. Okay, so you're a wealthy person, don't flaunt it. And he's talking about uh, destruction of the gate. If you exalt the gate, destruction is going to come. What does that mean? Well, in that culture, the doors of their houses are not adorned. Okay, very simple doors. There might be a lot of wealth in that house, but wise people don't make their doors real elaborate in that culture. Okay, because they know that that's the flaunting of the wealth. Now let's go to the Word of God. I'll show you an example in the Word of God from Babylon, in Second Kings twenty-five. Verses 8 and 9. Uh, 2 Kings 25, 8 and 9. So we see the example of Babylon. <clears throat> when they invaded into Israel and they burned the house of God, but that, that, the house of God wasn't the only one they burned. They looked for the doors or the gates of the wealthy. Okay? And, and so you could tell by the way they embellished the gates or adorned the gates, man, that person's got money. And the Babylonians, when they came in, they burned them. So look at it. 2 Kings 25, 8 and 9. The fifth month on the seventh day of the month, which is the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came Nebuchadnezzar, captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon into Jerusalem. And he burnt the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem and every great man's house burnt he with fire. See? So they're talking about if you exalt the gates, Destruction's coming. So don't, don't, you know. Now, I'm not saying don't put flowers around your door and lights around your door. Hallelujah. That's a pretty thing. You know, it's pretty. Amen. Right? The thing is, is what he's saying is don't, don't flaunt your wealth. If you got money, don't. The sad part about it is some people don't have no money, but they want to act like they have money. You know? And then there's somebody that have money and they want you to know they have money. Right? It's not a wise thing. It's what the Word of God is saying. Amen? Now, why does he couple this, verse 19, with strife, uh, transgression and strife, and exalting or flaunting wealth? Because most of the time, somebody that's flaunting their wealth got that money through strife. They got it the wrong way. Okay? 
So those two go together. The strife, the contention, the way they got the money, and then the way they flaunt the wealth goes together. Okay, amen. Verse 20. He that hath a forward heart findeth no good, and he that hath a perverse tongue falleth into mischief. Pretty self-explanatory. He that begatteth a fool doeth it to his sorrow, and the father of a fool hath no joy. Amen. No joy in life. Verse 22. A merry heart. Say a merry heart. Speaks joy, happiness, laughter. A merry heart doeth good like a what? Medicine. But what does it say? A, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Laughter is a medicine. Okay? Are you depressed, melancholy personality. Okay? It's a melancholy personality, depressed personality, stressed out, constantly worrying, constantly angry, full of hatred, full of bitterness, full of jealousy. All of that has an effect upon your health. See, laughter, merry heart, is medicine. But those other qualities, see, what he's teaching us is that the, these emotional instabilities that are in us, like hatred and anger and, uh, you know, uh, jealousy, bitterness, and stress, those things will, will affect your health. Now they took rats, I mean, y'all know what rats are, and I know we've all been gen regenerated. I mean, I'm just kidding. But anyway, you know what, how many of y'all know what rats are? Okay, they took rats, and they put them in a stressful situation. Okay, loud noise, you know, not much peace. Loud noise, a lot of stress, didn't give all the details of how they stressed the rats out. Okay. But they put noise to them and stressed the rats out. And you know what happened to the rats? They had all this stress and noise going on around them. Their high blood pressure or their blood pressure went up. Okay. And their glands didn't function properly. And they started producing ulcers in their body. They, put, they have put other animals under stress, under pressure. And they have found in other animals that when you stress the animal, they release fat into the blood. And that fat takes the walls of the arteries. Stress is a major killer. Okay? So what you and I do with, with stress, with the way that we handle our emotions, what we do with bitterness and anger and all those things that come to us is very important. It can affect you in a negative way, your physical body, to bring on all kinds of problems. Okay? In the process of preparing for this, I read a story about a man. He went to the doctor. He told the doctor, he said, Doctor, he said, I just, I'm tired of life and I'm thinking about committing suicide. I'm just so stressed out. You know, melancholy, you know, melancholy, unhappy, right? And so the doctor said, well, what you need to do is you need to go to the circus. And he said, at this circus, you're going to find uh, Garamaldi the clown. And Garamaldi the clown uh, is, is the best clown, the doctor said there is. He will make you laugh. That's what you need to do. And the man said, I am Garamaldi the Clown. <laughs> so, sometimes laughter doesn't work. Okay? I just said, you know, it was, it was a while. It doesn't always work. It's the way it is. Amen. But, I, so sometimes, you know, even when I'm preaching, what I do, especially... Um, not always, but sometimes I will 
will talk to you in a way that it creates some laughter. You know, like this story. Because, man, you know, when you're standing up here and you're looking in the faces of people, they're like, you know, like it's on, you know. And, and so, you know, I don't know what I've done to you, uh, but anyway, I'm going to say something to maybe make you laugh so we can get rid of this, some of this tension. Amen. So laughter is like a medicine. It's good. Praise God. So if you ever get face, you ever face them, you get face to face with somebody, man, and you just feel the tension, you know, just say something funny. Hallelujah. Just, but remember, they might be Garamaldi the clown. And it, sometimes laughter don't work. Okay. But that is, this is a true statement right here. I read a book one time on stress, the emotion of stress, and how many, uh, sicknesses and diseases, de degenerative diseases come upon the person as a result of stress in their life. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So, uh, praise God. Find something to, to joy. Find some joy in life, man. Some, find something to be happy about. You're killing yourself. Your bones are rotten. Drying up, you know. Amen. That's why I, I thank God that I live with Jeremiah. Jeremiah lives with us because he keeps us laughing all the time. Praise the Lord. Seriously. You know, he just, that's the way he is. He's a happy person. He's a happy person. That's why he makes us happy. You know what I'm saying? Praise God. And I thank God for that. Hallelujah. He's telling me today, you know, he says, sometimes I get stressed out, right? Are you, how many of y'all ever get stressed out? I get, I get a little stressed out, you know. And uh, I can't do the face that he made. But he said, this is the face you make, Daddy. Something like this. And he said, that's the preacher face. <laughs> he, he told me, he said, Daddy, you need to soften your face. He's he got the preacher face right now. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But, amen, he keeps me laughing. He keeps his crazy. It's just hilarious sometimes. Uh, amen. You know, and praise the Lord every once in a while when Sister Sandra, when she laughs, you know, just the laugh, I told her she needs to record it and sell it. And that laughter is contagious, you know. It, 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 you know, praise the Lord, she's going to make some money if she just recorded it and sold it. Amen. I'm surprised she didn't break out in laughter when I told her about Garamaldi the Clown. <laughs> you caused her to miss her cue, brother. <laughs> Man, I read about Garamaldi the Clown. I was sitting there thinking in my office. Now, when I say that, I'm going to hear that laugh from Sister Sandra. I didn't hear it. Amen. Yeah, we need to, you know what we need to do? We need to record that laugh and go on vacation. And when you get stressed out, I'm going to play it for you. Right, I know. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. So I believe the Word of God. A merry heart doeth good. It's like medicine. It really, it'll change really your health. You have the ability to make some choices, some decisions in life. You know, they go through life all stressed out and tense and pressured all the time, overwhelmed all the time, you know, bitter and mad. And... Praise God. Yeah. Says, You're a pain in the seat. And you will be amazed that tomorrow you'll have pain in your seat. That's right. You tell somebody, you're a pain in the neck. You'd be surprised you get a pain in your neck. Am I right, Sister Christina? You don't say that no more. Christina said some things similar to that, and it came on physically in her body. Right? Pain in the seat. And got pain in the seat. And she has these reoccurring friends that come and see her from time to time. And 
She's learned to stop talking about pain in the seat. So these reoccurring friends don't come back. You know. Amen. I don't see how some of y'all make it through life, man. Like, woo! Now, when I'm doing surgery on you, I don't want to be cutting jokes. You know, if I got the sword and the knife out and I'm cutting tumors out of you, I don't want to be laughing. That wouldn't be too good. If you went to the doctor's office, right? He's supposed to do a major surgery on you and he's sitting there laughing. <laughs> he, he called, I don't know if I want you working on me or not. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so there's a, there's a time for it. There's a time for it. So I'm over here cutting on you. I'm not going to be looking like I'm enjoying it, you know. Seriously. Now, they put a, a, a mouse in a cage next to a, 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 a cat in a cage. Okay? Now, don't go home and try this. Teenagers. Put a cat in a cage next to a mouse in a cage, and that mouse will die because of anxiety. And that cat can't even get to that mouse, but it's that anxiety. It'll cause it to die. Aren't you glad Jesus is the bishop of your souls? He didn't just come to heal us, remove our sin, but He's the bishop of your soul, your emotions. And sometimes I pray to God, God, you're the bishop of my soul, man. My soul is crazy right now, stressed, overwhelmed. I need you to come and be the bishop of my soul, minister to the puritans thereof. Things that are deep within me. That's why then they offered the sacrificial lamb, the Passover lamb. The Bible said they also cooked the puritans thereof. And the puritans is the inward parts of the, of the animal. Jesus Christ died so you would have emotional healing. Say praise God. Emotional healing. God will give you laughter. He'll give you Holy Ghost laughter. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. So you get so full of God, man. You're just so full of the joy of the Lord. Right? You ever been melancholy, just all down in the dumps and discouraged, depressed? And, and you and you think about it, you, there's nothing really to be even discouraged or depressed about, but you are. And then maybe there is some reason. But just get in a prayer room somewhere and say, God, I need you to be the bishop of my soul. The puritans thereof, the inward parts of me. Heal me. Hallelujah. Create a lot of sicknesses. A lot of sicknesses come on as a result of stressful things, emotional things. Amen. Well, I'm almost done. Verse 23, A wicked man taketh a gift out of the bosom to pervert the ways of judgment. This verse simply tells you don't take bribes. Bribes. Don't be the kind of person that you can be bought. Bribes. Verse 24, Wisdom is before him that hath understanding, but the eyes of a fool are in the ends of the earth. That means this, that a fool's goals ultimately will bring destruction. Ultimately. Fools have goals. They do, brothers and sisters. It's not just the righteous that have goals, but fools have goals. But their goals end up, the end of the earth, they end up in destruction. Okay? Amen. So don't be a person that has foolish goals. Verse 25, A foolish son is a grief to his father and bitterness to her that bear him. And this applies to the women too. You have a good son, you better thank God you've got a good son. You've got a bad son, Man, that brings a lot of pain, a lot of grief. Got a good daughter? You better thank God you got a good daughter. Amen? Bad daughter brings a lot of pain to your life. It's the Word of God. No, the Word of God. And see, He likens these things. The people who are not good sons or good daughters are people who don't fear God. They don't fear God. That's the ultimate line of wisdom is fearing God. They're a good son. I'm going to tell you, it's because they fear God. They're a good daughter because they fear God. If they don't fear God, they're not going to be the right kind of children. Amen? So verse 25, A foolish son is a grief to his father and bitterness to her that bear him. You think about there's one example in the Word of God that sticks out. His name is Reuben. Firstborn son of Jacob. 
brothers and sisters, the firstborn son. It means he had promises, blessings coming to him because he was the firstborn. Double portion of the inheritance of the father. Right? He had the right to be the king and priest of the house. Reuben. And at first, when little Reuben was running around, Reuben had a lot of promise. Jacob saw Reuben knew, yeah, that he looks like he's got a lot of promise, a lot of potential, a lot of possibility in little Reuben. But as Reuben grew up, the Bible said he was unstable as water. Unstable as water. Had sexual relationships within the home, within the family. It's a mess. Became, as the scripture says, a shame, a grief to the father, bitterness to her that bear him. You know, you better thank God today if your children turn out right. I mean, I, you're looking at some of them, you say, man, they, they got a lot of possibility and a lot of promise. That doesn't mean they're going to turn out right. Better been a lot of time praying over them, putting the word of God in them. And even then, in a the godly home, sometimes you have Rubens. They're just unstable as water. No matter what you do, they're just never going to do what they're supposed to do. Okay? Amen? But we'll be a wise son. Make the, make the father happy, glad. Amen? Verse 26. Also to punish the just is not good, nor to strike princes for equity. Simply don't, don't punish somebody that's innocent. Amen? Or do you punish somebody that's innocent? This Word of God. The Bible tells us we shouldn't do that. Amen? It's not a good thing. Verse 27, He that hath knowledge spareth his words. That means they control the tongue. If somebody's got wisdom, controls the tongue. They have the ability to control their speaking, their tongue, right? Amen? So the Bible tells us here, He that hath knowledge spareth his words, and a man of understanding is of excellent spirit. Verse 28, Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. And he that sheddeth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. Amen? Our ability to control our tongues shows our wisdom. All right? Praise the Lord. Don't go around giving somebody a piece of your mind. You don't have much left to give. So just, you better hold on to all you got and put more of the Word of God inside of you. Praise the Lord. And uh, amen. Be, be, be slow to speak, quick to listen. Listen. Hear. Okay? And then you'll know when to respond. Praise the Lord. It's a sign of wisdom. Let's stand. God bless you. Father, we ask God your blessing to rest upon your people. Lord Jesus, keep your hand upon them. We thank you, Lord, for your awesome word today. We pray, Father God, that we will continue to pursue joy in our life, happiness in our life, peace in our life. Uh, Father God, it's available to us if we will pursue it and seek after it according to your word. Help us, Lord God, to avoid the pitfalls of the scriptures that show how joy can be stolen from us. And we give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. And